Okay, so I'm Claire Mason, and today I want to talk about a topic that's really important and really interesting to me, um, and that would be the power of music. Growing up, uh, we had a lot of music in my house. My parents always talked about the importance of it when they were growing up, and they introduced me to a lot of different genres. And I've since found several more on my own, but the one that I found to be the most influential was the music of the 60s. As many of us know, the 60s were an extremely tumultuous time in American history. African Americans fought for, uh, they fought against racism in the civil rights movement. Uh, women were fighting for equal treatment in the workplace in the, fem in the feminism movement. And many of the uh, people in the United States, particularly the young people, were fighting against the needless sacrifice of their peers in the Vietnam War. Um, <clears throat> in this time, it made it really difficult for people to trust the government. Uh, they didn't feel loyal to their country so much as they felt kind of betrayed by the people who were in the higher positions of power. And as Frank Zappa put it, youths weren't loyal to flag, country, or doctrine, but only to music. One of the biggest songs of the time um, was Pete Seeger's We Shall Overcome, which was he produced in 1963. Uh, the Library of Congress describes it as the most powerful song of the 20th century. And it only started out as an African-American hymn. It came to be a protest song in the 1940s when African-Americans used it for protesting the Charleston, South Carolina tobacco companies because they didn't feel like they were being treated equally, or even fairly for that matter. Um, but it didn't really reach its extreme notoriety or its iconic status until the 60s when Pete Seeger brought it to the mainstream and made it his own and people started to sing it at protests and rallies for things that they really thought were important, such as the civil rights movement. I think most of us have heard of John Lennon. Um, he and the Plastic Ono Band uh, performed Give Peace a Chance in 1969, which, as you can imagine, is about peace and anti-war sentiments, particularly involving the Vietnam War, which was going on at the time. It sold 900,000 copies in the United States and another 400,000 worldwide because a lot of people just, it was easy to connect to. It was kind of upbeat, but also focused on some of the problems that were going on at the time. And it happened right around the same time as John Lennon and his wife did, his wife Yoko Ono did their famous bed in, which was an example of musicians taking part in peaceful protests at the time. And even now it's kind of an iconic example of passive protest. One of the biggest albums of the time was Bob, Dil Bob Dylan's The Free Will and Bob Dylan. Um, it was one of his most successful albums, and it consisted almost entirely of protest songs, including um, Masters of War, which, as you can imagine, is kind of an anti-war song, um, Oxford Town, which is about the first African-American student at the University of Mississippi, and Blowing in the Wind, which even now is one of his greatest hits, and it just is about kind of discontent with the state of America at the time, particularly with our uh, part in the war. Um, although this album was popular, none of the particular songs, though, became quite as important as Pete Seeger's Waist Deep in the Big Money, which tells the story of a big fool platoon leader. He urges his troops to ford a stream despite how dangerous it could be for them, and it's supposed to be a metaphor for uh, President Johnson's persistence in the Vietnam War and how he kind of disregarded the best interests of all those involved. Um, in 1967, Pete Seeger was supposed to perform it on CBS, but they cut it from their show because they felt that it was too openly anti-Johnson. The um, media censorship uh, activists and the freedom of speech activists were all over this, and Pete Seeger was eventually allowed to perform it live, in full, on CBS in 1968. <clears throat> why are these songs important, and why did they get so popular? Well, I think the answer to both, the, both of these questions is that they target the youth. They, most of these um, performers were aimed toward people below the age of roughly 30, because these, this is the most passionate part of the American uh, population. Um, people would come out to protests and rallies, or even just hanging out with one another. They would hear these songs, and it would really stir a sense of 
aggression or passion for what they felt was go needed to happen and what was going on. Um, and also just the nature of the songs themselves was easier to get behind back then. There were a lot of uh, songs based off of hymns and chants and like call and response style. So you could walk into somewhere, hear a song, and for the first time just start singing along with everybody else and feel really part of something bigger. Uh, the song we were talking about earlier, We Shall Overcome. As you can see, I've highlighted the chorus in green. It repeats five times. And even the verses are not very different from one another. So I bet, I mean, we're, we're all smart people. I bet if you like, studied this for less than 10 minutes, you could memorize the whole song, which is kind of the point. If you're marching along with thousands of people, you can just keep, walk in and hear it and join in singing with somebody else. John Lennon did something similar with the repetition, but he also threw in a lot of cultural references to kind of make the notion more concrete so that people realized more specifically what he was singing about. And I think Woody Guthrie put it best when he was talking about music and said, I think real folk stuff scares most of the boys around Washington. A folk song is about what's wrong and how to fix it, or it could be who's hungry and where their mouth is. And who's out of work and where the job is, and, or who's broke and where the money is, or who's carrying a gun and where the peace is. That's folklore, and folks made it up because they seen that politicians couldn't find nothing to fix, or nobody to feed, or give a job to work. So, we know that this music is out there, but is anybody listening to it? Well, yeah. I think a lot of people have heard of the 1969 you know, Three Days of Peace and Music, which occurred at Woodstock. But even before that, there was the Newport Folk Festival. Um, it started in 1959, and it continued through the 60s, 70s, and all the way up until today. It was supposed to be kind of a quaint little folk festival. You know, it started out nothing very large, just a little thing going on in Newport, Rhode Island. But it gained a lot of traction, particularly at its height in 1963, when it had 18,000 visitors and, and made $70,000. Um, it had such artists perform as Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, Phil Ox, Pete Seeger, all the biggest names in folk and protest music were there at the time. And so it really was a chance for these artists to get their opinions out there and kind of share in a community of people who could stand up for the same things that they cared about. And so these politicians, these, uh, excuse me, these musicians, not politicians, they were standing up for things that they thought were really, truly important. But, I mean, how much do we do that today? The people love Taylor and Adele and Drake and Kanye. They climb to the top of the billboard charts and, you know, we hear them on the radio. But what have they actually done for our society other than just, you know, get us in a good mood at parties or, you know, we're hanging out with friends? A lot of people would say that we just don't really need that anymore. You know, the times in the 60s were different. It was a tough time. We needed these powerful lyricists. But if you look at the newsstands, you realize that the same issues are kind of still here. <clears throat> 60 years after the beginning of the civil rights movement, we still have racial tensions and discrimination, <coughs> which were the basis of the Black Lives Matter movement, which started in 2013. Again, here you see women who are just looking for equal treatment in the fact that they want to be fair, treated fairly in the workplace. And here you want, you see um, gay Americans who just want equal treatment and being able to marry who they want. People are still looking for rights. They're not guaranteed just yet. And somehow we often forget that, <clears throat> we often forget that there's a war that's been waged in Iraq for over 10 years. In the 60s, people were outraged that their peers and their family members were being sent to the front lines. And we seem to have just developed this rather blasé attitude toward the whole thing. And I think it's because problems today aren't brought to our attention constantly like they were back then. We tend to put them in the back of our minds. But if musicians were to sing about them, we would be reminded and we might feel more passionately about what's wrong. And occasionally musicians do, like, they do this. Um, Malcolm Moore and Michael Jackson have produced songs that you know, cost some social change, but these are few and far between. And I don't think they're as powerful as they were before. 
it's a step in the right direction, but we're not there yet. And finally, I think that Phil Ox put their purpose very clearly when he said, young people are disillusioned. We want to reinforce their disillusionment so they'll get more involved and do something. Not out of a general sense of rebellion, but out of a real concern for what's happening or not happening. Thank you.